Walters Museum in Baltimore opened in 1934. It was formerly a gallery that used to charge for entry. It's now a museum that presents a wide array of art from the third millennium BC up to early 20th century. William and Henry Walters, a father and son duo, collected and bought most of the pieces that make up this original collection. Throughout the museum, there are symbols of each of the men's initials that demonstrates and shows which pieces Henry bought and which ones William bought. In 1931, Henry Walters donated these 22,000 works to the city of Baltimore for the benefit of the public. This collection he donated contained works from Egypt, Greek and Roman eras, medieval art, and Renaissance bronze, as well as Chinese ceramics and bronze, and some ancient Near Eastern works. In the area of the Walters Museum, which we are standing in now, which is dedicated to the ancient Near Eastern art, we could not help but be drawn to this piece, entitled Relief with Winged Genius. It is from about 883 BCE to about 859 BCE. This piece was originally from the palace of King Ashurnasir Paul II. It was from ancient Mesopotamia, so the figure depicted in a shallow relief is of genius. This relief is carved into alabaster. So, genius is a kind of deity that is usually represented by his horned headdress and wings, which you can clearly see in this relief carving. However, in this specific representation, he is also holding a cone in a bucket. Yeah, this is interesting. This relief would have been next to a second carving that would have been shown a tree. He would have been anointing this tree for protection with the bucket and the cone. You can tell that he was sculpted to show the power of these people because so many small markings were made in his beard, face, wings, and body. Yes, he is an incredibly powerful deity. Genius is usually seen as proactive deity. That is, placed near doorways to protect people and buildings. He is very clearly a powerful being because just of his sheer size in the carving, as well as the muscle tone you can see in his arms and legs. However, we are unable to get the full effect of this piece because the colors have faded. It would have originally been painted in color and would have been such a beauty to admire on the palace walls. You can also just really sense the wisdom from him as well, specifically because his beard is just so long and defined with the um, specific carving into it. This would have been really specific to his wisdom. You can also see some cuneiform located on the skirt of genius. This cuneiform would have helped to increase the power depicted by the relief, because written language then was, very, was a very powerful tool. Overall, it is a great piece that portrays the culture and power of ancient Mesopotamia. As we move through the museum, we enter the Egyptian section. We have stopped now at our admiring the God's Bearing Gifts, which was carved on Granodiorite. This is from 360 to 343 BC. It is truly marvelous. Ah, uh, yes, this is another shallow relief carving, only this time from Egypt. It was originally from a temple wall. These temples would have been covered in reliefs with art for and of the gods. This one here shows some gods bringing gifts. At first, we are unsure who the gifts are for, but we can make some conclusions that the gifts are being taken to the war god, on Yeshu because the texts um, written on the bottom display his name. But what this piece shows is a common artistic theme of a frontal shoulders and body, but with profile face and the feet seen very often in Egypt in profile. This was done to show each element in its most recognizable angle. This piece shows how important the gods were to the ancient Egyptians. They made these gods the main focus of the piece by just how much of the relief they take up. The Egyptians were very big on sacrificing, especially to their gods. Specifically, the gods were carrying the king's name on the offering plates they hold. This really symbolizes the king's loyalty to the gods because he is sacrificing himself to serve these gods. Yet for all these reasons and representations that we have discussed in this relief, it appears that one of the pieces you have to check out while visiting the Walters Museum is this piece. It is just a great piece that encompasses the Egyptians' fascination with their gods. Yes, now as we move through the museum, we are moving into the Greek area. There are so many wonderful pieces here, but the figure of an Amazon warrior stood out the most to us because it's a figure of a woman and this is not as common at the time. So, it really this, isn't. so this is a figure of an Amazon woman warrior. 
These Amazon women fought against the Greeks, so it's interesting that they would depict her in such a classical way, since they usually depict their enemies as barbarians. But since, since she is also displayed in the counterposto pose, all of her weight is on her left leg, which is bent, and her right leg is locked and straight. She may have been in the process of walking, specifically most likely turning around the corner. This pose really shows her in a natural, ideal way because she looks very relaxed and comfortable just walking around. We can really picture it. While we are missing her head so we can't see her facial expression, it would probably fit with the classical theme and show her in a very natural yet ideal manner. It was said that this original bronze copy showed her with a wound under her right breast, but it's not shown in this one. The elegance of the piece is really seen in the drapery of her clothes. The various depth and carving on her drapery depict how natural the flow of her fabric would have moved as she walked, as some would be swaying deep and some more shallow. However, it does not appear as classical as some of the other sculptures of, of female figures that we see during this time period, but this is probably due to her status as an Amazon warrior. Typically, you would see a longer dress shown on the female sculpture, but since she was a warrior, that probably went with the shorter dress because she had to be capable of lots of different movement in the battlefield. Because this sculpture was able to portray many of these classical art themes that we commonly see in the Doriferous and other classical sculptures, yet it adds a twist of the woman Amazon warrior, we just really feel it's such a marvelous piece that should be studied while you're at the Walters. It's just a really incredible piece. And as we move further into the gallery, we are looking at Roman art here. We were immediately drawn to this sarcophagus, specifically the one titled The Sarcophagus with the Abduction of Persephone by Hades, from 200 to about 220 AD. As you can see, it's made of marble. On the left, we see Demeter, Persephone's mother, who is desperately searching for her. Some of the other gods are also helping to search for Persephone. As we move to the right of the sarcophagus, we see then the bearded Hades, taking her to the underworld on his chariot. This is the main scene of the sarcophagus because it really draws your eyes in. You can clearly see Hades holding on to Persephone and forcing her to go with him. Yes, for the other gods and goddesses, we see Artemis in a short dress, Athena wearing her symbolic helmet, and we also see Hermes with a winged helmet appearing twice, once on the left searching and again on the right as an accomplice of Hades. This is a deep relief carving in the marble because we um, we see each of the figures almost depicted in 3D. This deep carving really brings out the emotion in the scene. We can almost feel Demeter's stress and anxiety as she searches for her daughter. That is very true. Even the horses, the way they are called, they are showing movement and emotion within the stag piece that is also being shown in the figures. To really appreciate the depth and emotion depicted in the sarcophagus carving, one really needs to spend time face to face with the piece. It's a piece that must be visited while at the Walters. So now we're moving into the early Christian and Byzantine era. When we entered this area, we were really drawn to the fuller brooch. While its shiny silver surface draws in your eyes, what really draws you in then is how it has so much packed into such a small piece of art. Ah, uh, yes, this is also one of my favorite pieces to see here. So we are in the late Dark Ages. We have the silver piece inlaid with niello. Niello is a black mixture of copper, silver, and lead. Usually, this brooch will be pinned on a lady's garment. It is composed of five central compartments that house figures, each one representing one of the five senses. The figure in the middle, which represents sight, really draws the viewer's attention first. It's bigger than the others, so the artist pulled on the abstract idea that larger figures are more important. So we can really make the conclusion that sight may be the most important sense. The sight figure in the center may also be focused on the most because its large eyes just stare right back at you, really drawing you in to focusing and studying on it first. Then your eyes move out toward the other four compartments. Um, this abstract idea being used here is that the most frontal or center figure is the most important. So I really do get a feeling that sight is the most important one. What is interesting here is that as your gaze continues out towards the perimeter, you see 16 smaller circle compartments, each of which are depicting either angelic figures or symbols of the earth and heaven. 
There is also a mathematical sense to this approach, as it can be even evenly divided into fourths, and then these can serve as their own sort of semi-broach, which is just incredible in itself. So we also get an idea of part to whole here. We have these five separate senses that rely to us information, but all together they give us a complete view of our world and our heavens. We need all of them to make up the entire whole, even when some may be more important than others. This piece was made in England, and it thematizes the relations of human beings to the world and beyond. And it is such a great piece for one, for this reason. I really like it. There's just so much, so much to unpack from such a small item. There really is. So now we're moving on um, into the medieval Romanesque and Gothic eras. So we're stopped now in front of the heads of Old Testament kings. They are a rep representation of Romanesque and Gothic art. And then we also see here the heads of apostles, which are a more Gothic style. They are one of our favorites and should definitely be on your must-see list in this section of the Walters. I would agree. The heads of the Old Testament kings pieces start to shift the Romanesque style that was popular at this time into a more naturalistic Gothic style. You can tell this is beginning to shift to Gothic time because the curling waves in the hair are much more natural appearing than that was seen in Romanesque style carvings, whereas using the heads and columns was a very Romanesque idea. These heads were part of the facade of the Abbey Church of St. Denise. They were representations of the Old Testament kings who are patrons of this monastery and were placed here to serve as models and reminders for how the French kings should act during this time period. Perhaps the people are really trying to sell these Old Testament kings as models. So they also try to make them appear very ideal and perfect so people want to be like them as a sort of propaganda idea. There are also the heads of the apostles, which are also Gothic because their face, facial features are very symmetrical and natural. Also, they portray the curly hair very natural. It is important to remember that while these heads are similar, they are from different times. Attaching these figures to columns would have depicted them as living pillars of the church, so they would have been very well known and respected in their churches. These apostles would have also been in the church to serve as models for how the people should act, since they are indeed the living pillar of the church and what it stands for. So these apostles' delicate faces and smooth lines really demonstrate the classical elements. They bring back in the naturalistic ideas from the classic Greeks, and it really has some symbolic meaning here. This is why when you're at the, Al the Walters Museum, along with the other pieces we've mentioned, you should really check these heads out as well. All in all, this museum offers a great insight to the art of different time periods. Personally, I really enjoy the Roman sarcophagus because of the narrative portrayed in such a deep carving. You really have to check it out. That was a good piece, but mine was obviously the full, full approach. I spent a majority of my time in study at the Walters Museum admiring the mathematical proportions and spatial divisions of all the different depictions, both interior and exterior. The Walters Museum houses a very impressive and diverse collection of masterfully crafted pieces from many different eras. I'm so glad we came here. So it's very hard for me to pick a favorite, but if I had to, I would pick the Greek Amazon warrior sculpture because it just really gave me a sense of girl power at a time when there was not very much. The Walters Museum is a great place to go and study art, but if you were to skip over these pieces, you would really miss out on a lot. They are all unique ways to see the different styles used at their respective times. Agreed.